Now for the news in detail. The number of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. has crossed 1 million, making up almost a third of the global tally. The death toll in the country has crossed 58,000 as over 2,200 people died in the last 24 hours. Worldwide, the number of deaths is over 217,000, with more than 3.1 million infection cases. More on that now in this report. As COVID-19 pandemic continues to rattle global economies, many countries are lifting restrictions. In the U.S., House of Representatives will not be reconvening next week as Washington, D.C. remains under a stay-at-home order until May 15th. Elsewhere, the French Parliament approved plans to ease lockdown from 11th May, while Spain has also announced a four-phase scheme to return to normality by the end of June. But Russia has extended its lockdown measures until 11th May, warning the virus has not reached its peak in the country. The situation is still very difficult. The specialists and scientists we keep in touch with to check our actions and plans say that we are yet to pass the peak of the pandemic. In Africa, the number of infection cases has more than doubled in two weeks, despite the lack of testing. Senegal's response has been the best in the region with the fastest recovery rate. We just distributed the first kits of food aimed at the most vulnerable population, one million households all around the country, which will impact 8 to 10 million Senegalese. Meanwhile, the International Rescue Committee report says globally one billion people can get infected with the virus. Pakistan has recorded its highest number of infection cases and daily deaths from COVID-19. The health ministry said 28 people died, while 806 tested positive in the last 24 hours. The ministry says the death toll has increased to 327, with nearly 15,000 cases so far. It said 3,425 people have recovered across the country, while 129 remain critical. The ministry said nearly 166,000 tests have been conducted countrywide, with 8,530 since yesterday. Meanwhile, the federal cabinet has approved the assistance package for health workers who died fighting COVID-19. Deceased health workers will be entitled to the same package as applicable to government servants in cases of being martyred. Pakistan has summoned a senior Indian diplomat and has registered a protest over ceasefire violations along the line of control. In a statement, the Foreign Office said such senseless actions by Indian troops violate the 2003 ceasefire agreement and international law. The office said due to indiscriminate firing by Indian forces in the Rakhchikri sector, two women were wounded. It said egregious violations of international law reflect consistent Indian attempts to escalate the situation along the LOC. It said raising tensions along the border, India cannot divert attention from the grave human rights situation in occupied Kashmir. The office said India has so far committed 913 ceasefire violations along the line of control and working boundary. Indian forces have martyred two more youth in Shopia district of occupied Kashmir. Occupation troops targeted the civilians during a cordon and search operation in Zainapura area of the district. Hundreds of locals took to the streets to protest the killings of innocent civilians. The forces fired pellets and tear gas shells to disperse unarmed locals. Medics say two out of the six wounded by the pellet gunfire are in critical condition. The forces have martyred 10 Kashmiris over the past five days. The occupied valley is reeling under New Delhi's crushing curfew and communications blackout in place for the past 268 days. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom has expressed concern over the continuous decline of religious freedoms in India. In its annual report, the watchdog said India should be placed on the U.S. government's list of the worst religious freedom violators in the world. It said that the recently passed citizenship law in India is discriminatory against Muslims. It also pointed out that India's unilateral annexation of occupied Kashmir in August last year and the subsequent communication curbs in the disputed territory. The report also noted an upward trajectory in religious freedom here in Pakistan, mentioning the opening of the Kartarpur Corridor, allowing Indian Sikh pilgrims visa-free access to one of their holiest sites in Pakistan. 
Interstate tensions in India have flared amid COVID-19, as Tamil Nadu has constructed a wall on its border with Andhra Pradesh. Millions of migrant workers are stuck at state borders after the government announced a sudden curfew in the country. Officials said the step had been taken to stop migrants' entry into the southern state. They said since the chances of being detected at the main crossings are high, some tend to use little-noticed locations in remote places. Meanwhile, the eastern state Odisha has dug trenches alongside the Andhra Pradesh border to stop the inflow of migrants. Earlier, Karnataka state blocked its national highway connecting it to Kasaragod after the number of infection cases there spiked. India has reported 1,008 deaths and over 31,000 infection cases so far. In Afghanistan, three people have been killed and 15 others wounded in a suicide bombing near the capital, Kabul. Interior Ministry spokesman Tariq Aryan said the bomber blew himself up near the gate of the Afghan Commando Special Unit. The spokesperson said the attack took place in the Rishkhor area in PD-7 of the Char Asyab district. The Afghan Commando's special unit said the forces have transferred victims to hospital. No group has yet claimed responsibility for the attack. The NATO commander in Afghanistan, General Scott Miller, says the Taliban should expect a response if they continue attacks. In a meeting with the Afghan Defense Minister, Asadullah Khalid, Miller said the fighters should reduce violence as agreed upon under the Doha Pact. The commander said the reduction will give political leadership on all sides an opportunity to determine the peaceful way forward. Meanwhile, Khalid said Kabul is committed to any voice on peace and has respected the reduction in violence week. But he said the Taliban intensified violence following that week. The Taliban, meanwhile, have expressed concern over the condition of their prisoners after the report of COVID-19 spread in Kabul jails. In a statement, the group said the Afghan government confirmed that 46 prisoners in the capital have contracted the virus. The Taliban said they have already warned the Kabul administration over the dire conditions of prisons. The group said there are issues of food, drinking water, high density of inmates and lack of medical treatment. It said the U.S. is directly responsible as it has not forced the Afghan government to speed up the process of prisoners' release. The fighters said Kabul and human rights bodies did not take the situation seriously, which has resulted in a critical crisis now. The U.S. has expressed concern over the declaration of self-rule by the Southern Transitional Council in Aden City. In a statement, the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said STC's decision will only exacerbate the conflict and divert efforts from countering COVID-19. Pompeo called on all stakeholders to re-engage in the political process under the Riyadh Agreement. Saudi Arabia's cabinet has urged the STC to abide by an agreement to end a standoff with Yemen's government. In a statement, the cabinet said any step that is contrary to the Riyadh Agreement should be cancelled. In Libya, the UN recognized government of national accord says Khalifa Haftar's forces carried out a rocket attack on a field hospital in Tripoli. Officials said the attack inflicted enormous damage on the hospital and ambulances. They say Haftar's militias have continuously targeted hospitals and health staff. On Monday, Haftar unilaterally declared himself the ruler of Libya. In an address, the Eastern Army commander nullified the UN unity deal of 2015 as a thing of the past. The GNA has opposed Haftar's declaration and described it as a coup d'etat. In Syria, 40 civilians, including 11 children, have been killed after a bomb planted in an oil tanker exploded in the northern town of Afrin. In a statement, the Turkish Defense Ministry alleged that the attack was conducted by the Syrian Kurdish YPG militia. It said the blast occurred in a crowded area in Afrin center. The ministry also posted a video showing black smoke billowing in the air. Ambulances and fire brigades rushed to the scene as the blast set several cars and shops on fire. The ministry said 47 people were also wounded in the blast. 
This is one of the deadliest to hit a region under control of Turkish-backed forces. The UN has called on the international community to lift sanctions on Sudan to save the country from a humanitarian disaster amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Sudan remains on a U.S. blacklist as a state sponsor of terrorism, stifling investment. In a statement, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, said Sudan's transition towards peace and stability can reverse without global backing. Bachelet said acute resource constraints on Sudan's transitional government are threatening the promise of democracy and justice. She said unilateral sanctions must be removed and donors must step up to save millions of lives. The country has recorded 318 coronavirus cases and 25 deaths so far. The UN's peacekeeping chief has told the Security Council that tensions have risen over disputed territory between Sudan and South Sudan. In Lebanon, protests in different cities continue for a second night against growing economic hardship. Demonstrators smashed and set ablaze banks and clashed with the army. Security forces fired tear gas and rubber bullets to disperse violent protesters in Tripoli. Demonstrators called on the government to save the country from economic meltdown. Protesters in the southern city of Sidon hurled petrol bombs at a central bank building and set its exterior on fire. Yesterday, a protester succumbed to death after sustaining bullet wounds from the army in Tripoli. This is the beginning of the road. What you're seeing today is the beginning of the journey. It still did not start. This is the beginning of the journey. Let them bear with the pain and the anger of the streets. We are daily workers. If we work, we eat. If we don't work, we don't eat. May God change the situation for the better. Guillaume Soro, the former rebel leader running for president in the Ivory Coast, has been convicted on embezzlement charges in absentia. The presidential candidate has been sentenced to 20 years in prison. The verdict was announced after a trial that lasted only a few hours and was boycotted by Soro's lawyers. Soro is likely to be excluded from October's election when President Alassane Ouattara is due to step down. Prosecutors issued an arrest warrant for Soro in December, just before he planned to return home from Europe to launch his campaign. Soro was issued an arrest warrant for allegedly plotting a coup against his former ally, Watara's government, and stealing public funds. Soro has denied the charges, which he says are intended to prevent him from challenging Watara's preferred successor, Prime Minister Amadou Gon Kolibali, in the election. I'll be back after this break with more news. Stay tuned for that. Let's begin this segment of the Bulletin in China, where the fourth COVID-19 vaccine has gone into clinical trials in Henan province. The National Vaccine and Serum Institute developed the drug under the China National Biotech Group. This is the second inactivated COVID-19 vaccine developed by the CNBG and approved for clinical trials. Since the novel coronavirus outbreak, the CNBG has, allo has allotted, I should say, over $141 million to develop vaccines. The National Vaccine and Serum Institute President Wang Hui said they are tirelessly working to develop a vaccine. It usually takes several years for the research and development of a vaccine. But we have been working on shifts round the clock, which shortens the time span. This also demonstrates our Chinese strength and speed. Meanwhile, a Turkish patient has recovered from the disease after being treated with immune plasma therapy. China says its parliament will open a key annual session on May 22nd after it was delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. State media said the National People's Congress made the decision at a regular session of the Standing Committee. The National People's Congress said stemming the outbreak made it possible for the Congress to convene. The session was originally scheduled for March 5th before its postponement due to the contagion. Russia's atomic corporation Rosatom says the possible spread of novel coronavirus pandemic is a threat to its three nuclear towns. 
Rosatom Chief Alexei Likhachev said the situation in Sarov, Elektrostal and Desnogrosk is particularly alarming. Likhachev's remarks come on a day when Russia jumped to number eight worldwide, with over 99,000 confirmed cases and more than 900 deaths. The so-called nuclear cities are closely linked with Russia's atomic industry that is managed by the Rosatom Corporation. Likhachev said authorities were sending medical supplies to the closed town of Sarov and other towns with dozens of registered cases. Yesterday we received news about a number of positive tests at Belibina nuclear power plant. We are checking this information, running additional checks. The most important thing now is to prepare medical facilities, reinforce the resources, but the necessary equipment, and secondly to strict follow sanitary and epidemic service orders. The UN says lockdowns and disruption to health services can result in 7 million unintended pregnancies in the coming months. In a report, the UN Population Fund said 47 million women may lose access to contraceptives if the COVID-19 restrictions carry on for six months. The UN FPA Executive Director Dr. Natalia Kanem said millions of women and girls now risk losing the ability to plan their families and protect their bodies. UN FPA said six months of lockdowns can result in an additional 31 million cases of gender-based violence. The report said an additional 13 million child marriages could take place this decade as the crisis has disrupted efforts to stop this practice. Chile and Bolivia have reached an agreement regarding the hundreds of Bolivian migrants stranded in Santiago. Chile's foreign ministry said the country will quarantine the migrants for 14 days and then return them to Bolivia. Both countries agreed the migrants should be transported to the northern city of Iquique near the Bolivian border to self-isolate. For several weeks, Bolivian migrants set up camps near Bolivia's consulate in the Chilean capital amid closed borders. Earlier, Providencia Mayor Evelyn Matei warned of a potential humanitarian crisis, saying the standard migrants could pose a health risk. What we need is for Bolivian government to assure us that if the migrants participate in a well-controlled quarantine here in Chile, they will be allowed to enter their own country. Well, Chile's Health Undersecretary Paula Daza said the government had supplied all essentials to the migrants during their stay in Santiago. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has warned that it is dangerous to take unilateral paths in tackling the climate crisis. In a video message to the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, he said isolation is a trap and no country can succeed alone. In his remarks in the opening day of the dialogue, Guterres said, like COVID-19, greenhouse gases respect no boundaries. He said COVID-19 has put lives of billions of people around the globe in turmoil, inflicting grave suffering and destabilizing the global economy. Guterres said the pandemic exposed the fragility of our societies and laid bare deep inequalities, threatening the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. The Petersburg Climate Dialogue opened on Monday in Berlin with an appeal to place climate protection at the center of economic recovery. Bollywood and Hollywood actor Irfan Khan has passed away in India after a prolonged battle with cancer. He was admitted to a hospital in Mumbai after a colon infection yesterday. In a statement, the actor's team said Khan was a strong soul who fought till the very end and always inspired everyone. Referring to his cancer disease, the team said he fought many battles that came with it. Khan was among the first Indian actors to make a consistent mark in Western cinema, acting in movies like The Life of Pi and Jurassic World. The actor was diagnosed with cancer in 2018 and went to England for treatment. British Airways has planned to cut up to 12,000 jobs from its 42,000-strong workforce due to a decline in business amid coronavirus crisis. In a statement, the airline's parent company, IAG, said it needed to impose a restructuring program until air travel demand returns to normal. 
The IAG reported a loss of nearly $600 million in the first three months of this year. The airline said it will take several years to return to 2019 levels. In a letter to staff, BA Chief Executive Alex Cruz said there is no government bailout package for the airline and they have to overcome the crisis themselves. The pilots' union, Balpa, has vowed to fight every single job cut. European stock markets are trading mixed with low volumes after a deluge of major quarterly earnings reports. Investors stayed mute ahead of a monetary policy decision from the U.S. Federal Reserve due to be announced later in the day. London's FTSE 100 has gained over half a percent. Frankfurt's DAX is trading fractionally higher, while the CAC 40 in Paris is trading marginally lower. Major companies including Airbus, Deutsche Bank, Barclays, GSK and Volkswagen reported their earnings. Barclays posted a 42% fall in first quarter net profit year on year, while Standard Chartered reported a 12% fall in profit. In Asia, Seoul's Cosby led the gains, closing over half a percent higher, while the Shanghai Composite traded nearly half a percent higher as well. Meanwhile, the international benchmark Brent crude oil price has gained over 4%, while the U.S. WTI crude price has surged over 15%. Time now to find out what the weather is like around the world. For the latest updates on these and other stories, you can always follow us on our social media at Indus.news. Thanks for watching.